Hello, this is Lance Tarchione here with you on a uh, Ask the Agronomist special. We're calling the Agronomist Ass, and uh, joined here by uh, a friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Joe Sheffers. And we're here at AgTech, uh, live in person, thankfully, in St. Louis. Again, after uh, a, a few years of trying to do it virtually, and uh, I, I guess that's maybe better than not doing it at all, but uh, only slightly, in my opinion. So uh, very happy to be back uh, here live at a, at a real in-person ag tech. And I jokingly have been referring to ag, ag tech as this is kind of like the national sales meeting for agronomy nerds. This is where we get together with all of our technical colleagues and a lot of information sharing and updates on research projects and um, po poster sessions and uh, a little bit more of a kind of an academic feel to, to this meeting, which, uh, which I enjoy. So. Um, Joe, you're from way up north, and uh, we'll talk about the Northern Plains and your background. So uh, tell us uh, tell us where you come from and uh, w what you've done in your career. Sounds good. Well, thanks for the opportunity. You bet. Um, so I'm the regional agronomy lead for the Northern Plains. I'm based out of Brookings, South Dakota. Originally, I grew up on a small dairy farm that's still in operation in central Minnesota. So uh, I'm the oldest of four sons, and we're all in agriculture. Um, brother that's a couple years younger drew the short straw and he's home farming with dad and then I've been out in uh, South Dakota since I went to college there so I went to SDSU agronomy degree um, graduated with that went right to the seed industry at uh, the age of 22 and that's a short 26 years ago so I've been in the seed industry my whole career started out with a competitive company and basically the technical agronomist role that you're in then I came to uh, Monsanto in 03 as a tech development rep. I uh, was a tech development manager for a few years and then uh, managed the decal business for South Dakota as an area business manager from 09 to 13. And I've been in this role now for 10 years. Mm. So it's a great place to be. Uh, I've always wanted to farm or help people farm and this mm -hmm. is the best place to do it. Yeah, yeah that's <clears throat> kind of how I ended up in this role as well. I. Uh, I've, I've probably never told you this story, but uh, I've, I've told a lot of people this story. My, uh, <clears throat> my, my, my dad and I almost came to blows my senior year in high school because uh, all I wanted to do was stay home and, and farm. And uh, he, he had survived the 80s by taking two off-farm jobs, um, about put himself in an early grave trying to save the farm. He had no interest in his son that he thought had more potential than to be a farmer uh, staying home and farming. So uh, I, I had to go to college. And uh, l looking back, um, I've always said that being an agronomist is about as close as you can get to being a, f a farmer and drawing, oh, a right. drawing a paycheck. No doubt. When, uh, I, was a, when I was a kid, I fixed sideline loaders and the nurse spreaders, and that really helped me be a good TDR because I could fix a lot of combines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I uh, I was going to ask you, are your are, are your brothers as big as you are? You, I'm. You, yeah, I'm outpacing my brothers, yeah, but we're all pretty close. Yeah, and so yeah. you guys wouldn't fit under a dairy cow. That would be. Uh, a, that we, would be we can control them. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so the, uh, the thing that you mentioned, you mentioned Brookings, um, where I worked with you the most here in recent years was around the whole seed quality project right. that we've been involved in. And uh, right. Bro Brookings is obviously a, a city that, that I recognize because of the, the test quality testing that's, that's done out of there. And I have lots of growers that, you know, like to send samples off to, to Brookings to, to get quality work done. So. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about you know what that experience has been like for you and some of the initiatives that that we've undertaken to, to right. try to make sure we got the best product we can out in the marketplace. Right, right. So one of the areas that I I work in on behalf of the agronomy team is just how we manage our claims and how we uh, basically stand behind our product, and then that kind of morphed into a bigger project around corn seed quality. So. We've really taken a, a good look at that because there's a paradigm shift in the market that, that we have to embrace, which is you know the days of planting 80 acres of corn a day have now moved up to a full section mm -hmm. you know, with one tractor and planter. So we can pile up a lot of risk in a short mm -hmm. period of time. We want to get out there, get the crop in early, get the yield that, that we're shooting for. So it just demands more of our seed. So uh, you know we take that plus dynamics and genetics and seed treatments and testing and so forth, and we have to try to figure out you know, how do we bring the best product to market that can withstand two to three weeks of stress where that, you know, crops, seeds planted doesn't come up for three weeks. Um, you know, there's been a lot of third-party testing 
fair bit of it comes through uh, Brookings, uh, interestingly enough. Um, you know, I live there. Um, it's a lot of Sodak Labs. Uh, there's also SGS, which is a worldwide seed testing mm -hmm. organization, and, and they're a real large organization. But, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at seed quality and you know the project that we're working on is obviously to improve i feel we're making great improvements um, we have an education process on our hands mm -hmm. to kind of build confidence within and then also we have a field <coughs> testing approach that now is verifying it mm -hmm. which is unique to to us um, we just have such a large force of great agronomists that can actually verify our decisions which has really been a critical component to improving yeah it's um you know that, that is really a you know people get very passionate about you know wanting good quality seed and it's 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 a little bit they have a hard time believing sometimes and it's kind of frustrating agronomically uh, how often in, in in the real world in the field you know field conditions weather conditions things that have nothing to do with the quality of the seed um, more often dictate you know how that stand comes out um, and I, I just had a, a situation a couple weeks ago, ironically, that uh, a guy had sent off some samples for some third-party testing and was a, was a believer in that and, and still is, I think, but they accidentally sampled the same batch of seed twice and, and got back two Pretty different si results. significantly different numbers uh, from that, which I think you know he was intrigued by. I wasn't terribly surprised by that based on some of the work that you and I have been involved with, but I, I think that was a... A little bit of an eye-opening experience for him is well if if I want to think this number means something and I want to think that number means something and those two numbers which are vastly different are the same thing what does all that mean yeah biology doesn't conform to that right so if right. you're confused by it just look back at what happened in the last few years and you know it's just not black and white it's not an on and off switch mm -hmm. you know, your vigor is really what I'm calling a dimmer switch, and we have to figure out how bright do we want that light mm -hmm. in order to meet most of the scenarios that we find in the field. Right. And you you called out correctly that, uh, you know, we always have, I, I call them voodoo days. There's always days looking back in hindsight, and I, I think last spring we were involved in a, mm -hmm. you know, an effort to try to maybe predict what days might be a voodoo day. Right. Um, but if, if that voodoo day, when you, you know, should have been sitting in the tavern drinking beer instead of planting, um, if you socked in a thousand acres that day, that's, you know, that, that's a big deal. We're building out that tool. Mm -hmm. So we tested last year, we did it based on prior year experience, and we're going to try to help growers predict, you know, what level of risk if I plant it today or tomorrow mm -hmm. or the next day. And it, you know, it's not ever going to be perfect, right. but if I can help you you know, instead of planting 24 hours a day, maybe you should just plant eight hours today right, right. And, and not pile up your risk just based on what the current weather forecast is and then what it looks like out two weeks, three weeks right, from now. Right, right. I mean, it's, if, if you could predict the future, I mean, the, the, the five days after you plant is what's going to determine most times whether you should have planted or not. Yeah, for the um, most part. And, and that's the tricky part. And, and you and I have had this conversation in my market in particular, Northern Plains would be a little bit different. Um, moisture and an excess of moisture yeah. is more often what stresses our seed and and if you know that seed could have really good quality really good vigor really good everything if it's suffocating for two weeks in a wet saturated soil um, that's not going to end well well we store corn in a cold dry place right right, right. in the northern plains sometimes that's in the ground mm -hmm. but as soon as we add moisture to it that's when disaster happens right and, and I know there's uh, schools of thought on, you know, if, if we could get to the point where, you know, as, as an agronomist, I, I don't like telling guys you shouldn't plant or right. you should stop planting. Um, you know, I think what the seed industry needs to recognize is the grower, there's two risks. There's a risk of not planting and there's a risk of planting. No doubt. There is no option that there's no risk. Right. Each individual grower is going to have to make that decision for them. What you know, which do I think is the lesser of evils? Um, so, you know, from a um, from a seed company standpoint, um, you know, what what's our role in that decision making process? Yeah. So the the decision making process on a seed supply is always complicated, and I treat it like a triangle. So you have your supply, your demand, and your quality, and we have to mm -hmm. try to balance that 
all the time. So we do the best we can to forecast how much we think growers will want mm. in the following year. Mm -hmm. And we also try to grow extra to overcome some quality issues that we run into. But unfortunately, it's not a clean cut for every single product. Right. Sometimes you go out to you shoot to maybe grow 100 units of X, and you get all 100, maybe mm -hmm. a little more, and it's all great quality, and everything's good. Mm -hmm. Well, you could have until he just, until we decide we want 200 units. Or, of X. or it, yeah. you know, something happens. But then there's other products that come along, and you get half. And then mm -hmm. you have to make a hard decision and say, well, if this is where its quality is from a bigger perspective. Is it or is it not good enough? And what level of risk are we taking right. if we send it out there? Right. So that's what we struggle through. We do it weekly. Uh, we're looking at a lot more product today than we ever used to. Mm -hmm. And we know what we have. We just have to, you know, make those tough calls. We, we had a chance to uh, tour the, the facility at Waterman mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago as, as a technical organization. And I don't remember the statistics of how many samples are running through that place, but it's four hundred thousand a year, yeah. so it's just over a thousand a day. But in the yeah. middle of the battle, it's a couple thousand on corn alone, right. and there's right. like twenty six crops. Right, and they're doing all the veg crops, and it's and the biggest lab in the world. Yeah. So it it's highly professional and and such. But again, it's all about speed and time too. We can't just slow everything right. down to right. a grinding halt and try to get it to the grower in time. Right, right. Yeah, lots of. Uh, <clears throat> you know, lots of moving parts to balance and, and lots of gray areas to navigate through and it's and it's not as black and white as, as I think a lot of people would like to make it be and, and if you make it too black and white it's either going to take too long or you're going to lose too much supply or um, so there's 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 always going to be some art probably along with the yeah, science. That's the biological world right? So right. That's the way it works. So um, I, I guess let's touch a little bit um, on uh, other technologies that uh, we've got coming that uh, you see being a, a big impact in the, in the Northern Plains? So we're a market that's historically crop rotated, three crop rota rotations common, corn, soy, wheat, mm -hmm. for another cereal crop. We have a, a good amount of corn bean in the Eastern edge. We have kind of inconsistent rootworm pressure. What we're looking towards next is VT4 Pro. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that, that product on the moderate rootworm pressure acre, which we have a lot of. Mm -hmm. We had a quite a bit of rootworm pressure this season with root lodging and so forth. So we've kind of ebbed and flowed from the old VT3s mm -hmm. to double pros and smart stacks, and now this VT4 Pro has a market. So that's kind of near term. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had great success with the Extend platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no-till kosha. 240 just doesn't work in that market, so it's been really, really popular and really been a lifesaver for them because we were really running into trouble trying to control kosher, and it's mm -hmm. a tough weed. Mm -hmm. Water hemp's tough. We have water hemp, too, mm -hmm. but uh, kosher is just a little bit tougher. Mm -hmm. So those are the two big ones. Uh, short corn something we're looking at, but, you know, by design, we have a lot of short corn every year because it's too damn dry. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I would guess... Uh, Short corn in some of your environments would yeah. be really darn short. The 71 day hybrids we see in the northern edge of the North Dakota and Minnesota are already short. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, Joe, thank you for sitting down with us. Uh, pleasure to see you again. Nice to have a conversation and appreciate you sharing uh, some of your perspectives with our audience. And uh, thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll be back with you soon. You know, uh, area like, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, for example, where we have a lot of smallholder farms. You know, top end yield may not be the concern, but making sure that they get every year harvested, especially in an area that could be prone to typhoons, I mean, that's a big deal for them. Mm -hmm.